gotta keep chopping. Gotta keep on chopping. So the advantage of sycamore is that it has interlocking grain, and interlocking grain is twisted and it's, it runs all together, and it's extremely difficult to work, uh, extremely difficult to hew, but it doesn't crack very much. As it dries out, it develops tiny cracks instead of large cracks, and so it was the perfect wood for our finished product, but it meant that we had to work twice as hard to make the dugout from it. Persistence with the wood and patience with oneself are lessons that I think sycamore has to teach a lot of us. Sycamore is a hard, tough wood <laughs> to get anything out of. We decided to take the tools of the time. Uh, no chainsaws, no electrical powered or gas powered devices. We wanted to see what it would be like to build this this canoe using the tools that have been in use for hundreds of years. So the first thing we needed to do after we obtained the tree is that we had to make a flat spot on the top of it so that then we could start uh, hewing down to hollow out the part where the people would sit. The idea was to cut notches along the edge of the tree and then come through and split off those chunks and create a flat surface taking the round to the flat. So I tried to chop notches along wood using an axe and that worked fine but that took about eight minutes to chop out a, a wedge of wood down the four inches that we needed to go to make the to the top of the flat spot. So then we tried sawing them with a two-man hand saw, and what we discovered is that it took half the amount of time to saw the notches down as it did to chop them. And so we sawed notches all the way down the length of the tree, going across the grain, about every four to six inches, depending on if there was a knot or not, we made the notches closer together and then tried to split off the notches with an axe, but with that interlocking grain it was too tough. So we got out some wedges and a maul and just split by forcing those wedges into the cracks. We were able to split off those chunks and then as we moved down the tree we used an as to smooth that up to create the flat spot. This is a carving process. It's a matter of cutting wood out to waste it and then carving it eventually anyway to the point of getting a, a smooth functional bottom out of a log. Uh, sycamore is beautiful as it reveals itself underneath an edge where you take a sharp edge out and look at the grain and the color variation as you go. We've done a couple of things in cutting cross grain and then using an adze to literally rip pieces out it's almost another version of a fro where the sharpness of the edge if you're just driving it in between a short section of linear grain and prying the pieces out the edge wasn't as helpful as it is when you're literally cutting the stuff um, we've tried several different things and the approaches have varied as we've gotten deeper down which I think we all suspected because we knew we were going to eventually run out of the ability of an axe to reach down into the bottom of that thing to cut the cross grain before prying pieces out. And swinging cross grain or transverse to the log has its limitations when you get deeper because the handle gets in the way. So there comes a point as you drop down in the canoe that the work seems to be better going along the log in a, in a linear direction with the log and literally cutting Sharp tools have been important in all of this, and I'm glad that Yodan was here to, to do that for us. 
my first experience uh, with sharpening tools is actually from when I was really uh, young and I was uh, helping my grandfather to uh, sharpen his sai. I am uh, from Sweden and uh, I grew up in an area in, in the middle of Sweden uh, and the province is Jämtland. Sharpening tools have always been important for me. I have always seen uh, it as um, uh, the major thing to, to get the finished product uh, to have a sharp tool. Um, and by having my grandfather sharpening his sigh and we uh, us kids turning the, the stone for him I, I really saw the importance of how uh, a sharp tool can, can work for you and when he was cut, cutting the grass after sharpening his sigh it was wonderful to see how, how easy it was to cut so the first thing I, I do uh, when I sharpen a tool is to, to cut uh, an edge with the angle that I want and um, just by feeling the steel I, I can determine how steep I can make it or how, how small the angle I can make and still get a sharp edge. After the first cut I will have a, a rough stone to take away the first part of the wire edge and then I had have at least three more stones uh, before I get the final edge. I will first hone the, the, the iron on one side and then when I come to, to more uh, finer stones I will actually turn the, the metal on both sides and then in the end if I want I can polish uh, by using a leather strap or, or a machine to get the, the really really sharp sharp edge. I have a feeling for a sharp tool in my thumb um, some people are cutting their hair on their arms uh, just to show that it's um, razor sharp but that's actually uh, you can get it sharper than that with power tools I think that I can get an even better edge than with the original hand driven tools using a, a sharp tool is actually more safe than using a dull tool. Uh, you have better control about your your work and cut. Uh, if you have a dull tool, you might uh, force it to slip, and and then you can hurt your really hurt yourself. Because we were using hand tools, we had greater sensitivity. To our senses. Uh, we were able to hear and smell and see things that I think would have been obscured if we'd been using power tools. And I think the sense of smell was the thing that surprised us the most about working with Sycamore. First that all of us seemed to notice was where is the horse that just came by because there's a part of that tree that has a very clear horse manure smell and cucumbers and cantaloupes and watermelons and some indescribable smells. One seemed to me a bit like the the vinegar solution from around an empty dill pickle jar when there's nothing but the pickling fluid left. All from different places in the same tree. All within about a 10 foot section or less. Perhaps varying from what was once the butt of the tree where it stood next to the ground towards the top. Um, certainly there is a scientific explanation of some sort and a spiritual explanation and maybe the truth is somewhere in between. From uh, Sycamore I just um, learned that you know, it's uh, one of the spiritual trees. It's like a cedar. So um, that's one of the reasons why we come to realize it has five different smell.